Hello everybody, today I have a nice smooth game for you all. This is game 13 from My 60 Memorable Games and Fisher basically brilliantly shows how you attack and kind of the balance between attacking and defending and how you kind of conceptualize that in chess. So I think this is a really instructive game, a really fun one, a nice aggressive attacking game in the Sicilian. So let's jump in. So Fisher with the white pieces goes into the open Sicilian and he develops his pieces in a sort of way, which is very typical in these positions. Essentially, you play this move f3 uh, in order to prepare the move bishop e3, where they cannot respond with knight to g4 and take this bishop. And your idea is to go bishop e3, queen to d2, castle long, and set up some long attack with both of your bishops and this pawn storm. Black typically decides to attack on the queen side. So they decide to castle short, they get their rooks stacked onto the c-file, the queen comes to a5, sometimes you launch the pawn, and you have this really clash of attacks. White on the king side, black on the queen side. Anyways, we see this sort of develop, the bishop eventually coming to e3, the rook coming uh, to c8, long castles, and knight to c4. And now, a big decision for white. Now, way more typical in this position is to play bishop takes uh, on c4, but after rook takes, it is true that you have the nice uh, bishop and queen combo, and that does help in your attack. But at the same time, you just got rid of a very serious defender. This light square bishop is a great piece when it comes to holding your position together on the queen side. And therefore, black will also have a more easy attack. And so instead of this, white played the move queen to e2, which is really rare. But the point is after knight takes bishop, queen takes bishop, Yes, your attack is now a bit weakened and delayed, but this bishop, again, as I mentioned, a super nice defender, and similarly, black's attack it gets a little um, slowed down from this trade. So a nice little strategical decision there. We have castles and g4. Nonetheless, white is, of course, launching the attack and trying to do so as quickly as possible. So g4 followed by h4 and h5 is on the horizon, likely g5 as well. Uh, will come because it hits the knight and hits the pawn. When you go h5, it should be noted the pawn can block, so g5 is a bit more of an effective way to attack, and this is what we start to see here. Uh, the knight comes to e2, very smart um, and a very common maneuver. The point is the knight defends the other knight so that these sacrifices of rook takes e3 are really discouraged, but also the knight has great mobility to help in some attack potentially on the king side. We have rook to c5, and indeed, as I mentioned, g5, the effective way to proceed. h takes, h takes, knight to h5, and f4. Essentially giving the white pieces more flexibility and mobility. This is a nice move as well, because I think a lot of people, when they look at the move f4, the only purpose they have in mind is to go f5. And that doesn't look so promising in these positions. It's at least something you're going to have to consider a bit further. But the move f4 as a standalone move is good because it gives your pieces more flexibility and mobility. This queen, for example, now has the very easy access to the h uh, file with the h3 square. You can certainly imagine the rook stacking and then this rook perhaps can become a defender of the knight. So when you advance your pawns like this, you give your pieces more breathing room to act a bit more harmoniously, a bit more coordinated, and that can lend to, to better attacks and more successful attacks. Anyways, black is deciding uh, to do a similar thing, trying to coordinate their pieces, aiming at the c-file. We have king to b1, a nice typical idea getting uh, out of the line of fire from the rooks. The queen comes to b6, offering a trade. Of course, we decline because in this position, due to this bishop that is here, Black doesn't have the best uh, way to attack. Yes, this bishop is scary. Yes, the rooks are scary, but there's a lot of pieces defending here, and it's very difficult to attack. White, on the other hand, does have a more clear attack, and that comes um, through the move rook takes h5, pawn takes h5, queen takes h5, getting the other rook in, and trying to set up something on the h-file, which although, again, is quite vague and isn't necessarily bound to succeed, but it does seem to be a bit more promising, which is why black um, wanted to trade the queens and white decided not to. Now we have rook to c5, and here a very interesting choice from Fisher, the move queen to d3. I hinted uh, about this move rook takes h5, and indeed the engine says that this is the best option, which is why it's a bit surprising that Fisher would hesitate with this. But indeed you see that this doesn't um, actually 
result in a big difference because after bishop takes, knight takes, and knight takes f4, we have queen to f3, and the sacrifice does indeed come. So why did he decide to delay it? It's not very clear. In fact, the commentators of this actual game were contemplating the same question. But when you have more space, when you're the one that has a bit of an upper hand, you also have the luxury of taking more time, being a bit more patient, and really making sure that, that when you're ready to sacrifice, the sacrifice is justified. So queen to d3, um, takes, takes, and takes on f4. Now notice that queen to f3 is important here because you do keep intact uh, with this move, uh, with the square on h5. So after knight to h5, we have the sacrifice. As an example, if you go queen to d4 instead, well, after knight h5, it's not very clear how you're going to continue with an attack because if you take, you cannot directly take back the pawn and black can quickly set up some scenario perhaps where the pawn is defended um, and it's just a little bit more risky. So queen to f3 is a more immediate way to set up the sacrifice where after g takes, queen takes, the entire king side is opened up. Now, it should be noted, after rook takes, black can throw in this move, rook takes c3, which as I mentioned is a common technique here that black can employ in order to ruin the pawn structure, but with the bishop here, it's not as promising, um, and specifically, in fact, there's a nice idea here. If you take, then they take, not so clear. It's a bit better to give the sacrifice because after king takes, we slide the rook over, the king goes back, and now we take with the difference being the fact that the h file is open in such a way where white can very quickly attack. So queen to f6 or queen to h3 will both bring some mating ideas that are going to be very hard to defend from. So rook takes c3 does not work for that reason, and instead black decides to take the rook simply on h5, queen takes h5, bishop to e8 was played. Uh, once again, it is important to consider this option because um, it is a very serious uh, choice that, that black has in, in many of these positions, but again, it is not so promising in this specific case because again, we ignore the rook. We don't take it back immediately, but g6, and we go straight for the attack. And if they try to save the rook, well, then there's going to be some mating idea. In fact, already in this position, it is very difficult uh, to defend from this mating attack. So going back, uh, takes, takes, they decide to go bishop to e8, trying to bring an extra defender into the mix uh, with some ideas perhaps of f5 now or f6, uh, opening up the attack on the queen, and therefore queen to h6, very simply sliding the queen out of harm's way with the bishop, but even more importantly, out of harm's way with the rook, opening up the possibility of going g6 without the queen being hanging, and g6 is indeed the way to open things up here. And this, I think, this ending of this game is really, really um, instructive because it, it might not be so clear how you um, mate in this position, but I think the way that Fisher does it uh, is something that we can all apply to our games. So let's take a look. In this position, finally, uh, his opponent takes this sacrifice. We have takes and rook takes. And here, many people would probably consider rook to h1. But then you look closely and you see this move queen to d4, a nice defensive resource, and unfortunately there's just no way to make progress here. Therefore, going back, what uh, Fisher was trying to do here by playing queen to h6 was opening up this move g6 because after g6 and they take, you cannot take the pawn back, but now you go rook h1 with the key difference being the fact that the 7th rank is open. So this defensive resource does stop this mate, but does allow for queen to h7 with far more devastating effect. After king to f8, rook to f1, this is just uh, checkmate on the board. There is nothing left to be done checkmate. And in fact, this is how the game ends because after queen to h7, black decided to resign. So a nice, quick, instructive game, as I mentioned, very smooth, but there was this huge balance uh, that you had to really think about. How do I defend while still attacking? And I think these decisions early on, first of all, this idea of giving away the dark square bishop, which was really foreign at the time, at the time, much more typical, uh, almost obligatory, was bishop takes e4. No one would consider to give away such a valuable dark square bishop, but indeed, it does mean that black has a very difficult time to attack this setup here, um, on the queen side. Um, meanwhile, white still launches the pawn, so a, a very nice um, idea that Fisher really employed here for the first time in history, this idea of keeping a defensive structure which is really solid and safe with the bishop on b3 while still maintaining great attacking possibilities. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Make sure you subscribe for more quick recaps like these, and I'll see you guys next time. Peace out.